So we are going to wait just one minute um, to let uh, people continue to join the session and then we'll begin. Hey, Sergeant Handy. Could you uh, check your phone for me for a second? Good afternoon. Welcome to our seventh Lunch and Learn presented by the Charlottesville Police Foundation and the Charlottesville Police Department. My name is Gail Milligan. I'm the executive director of the foundation. Now is such an important time for us as members of the community to understand more about policing and the law. And that makes us excited to be presenting this series and very happy that you're joining us today. We so greatly appreciate the partnership with CPD and the time and effort all of the presenters have invested in bringing this information to us. We also appreciate the support from the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy and from our hosts, Diane and Katie. The Lunch and Learn series is one of the outcomes of our engagement in the community last year and is part of our core mission to inform and connect. In each session, Members of the CPD will offer unique insight to the work of the department and answer questions you have about that work. Before we begin, I want to share a brief overview of our work at CPF. Simply stated, the Charlottesville Police Foundation serves the community by serving the police. We seek to improve the quality of life in Charlottesville by offering a community partner for our police department the foundation promotes excellence in police services by investing in programs that enhance the department and yet are beyond the reasonable reach of the city's budget. We reward excellence. We strengthen the connections between the department and the public through outreach programs and community events. Some of the ways we serve include housing grants to officers so they can live locally an awards dinner and officer of the month program, advanced training, grants for specific needs such as canine, technology and new community programs like this Lunch and Learn series, outreach events like Cops for Kids Day and the Charlottesville Night Out which celebrates police and community. To clarify our role, while we collaborate with the Charlottesville Police Department we are an independent 501c3 nonprofit. The extent of our advocacy role for the CPD is to improve the quality of policing as a community service. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Lieutenant Larry Jones has been an officer with the Charlottesville Police Department since 2006. During that time, he's had multiple assignments with the, within the department that include midnight shift, daylight shift and investigations. He's a trainer for the department in a variety of topics, including defensive tactics and the crisis intervention team. Currently, he's in charge of the midnight shift patrol and our crisis negotiation team. Sergeant Russell Handy Jr. is one of the two hiring and recruiting managers for CPD. Sergeant Handy joined the department in August of 2007 his first assignment was as a certified bike officer and worked the downtown mall for several years. He's been assigned to the crisis negotiations team for approximately nine years and has been the team leader for four years. Prior to his career in Charlottesville, he served as a police officer at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island for six years. 
a note, you can add your questions to the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen, but we'll hold all questions until the end of the presentation. Lieutenant Jones and Sergeant Handy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate being here. All right, uh, today's presentation is to provide you with a brief background of the history of hostage slash crisis negotiations and uh, provide you with some insight as to what negotiators do. Um, I know the term hostage negotiations gets thrown around a lot. Um, we use that title less because every situation isn't uh, always involving a hostage, but usually every situation does involve somebody who's in a crisis. So uh, just a brief history. Uh, the first hostage negotiations team in the world was created in 1973 by the New York Police Department. The hostage negotiations team was formed in response to four previous incidents, uh, which occurred within two years of each other. Uh, the first incident uh, occurred in 1971 uh, in Attica. Uh, 2,200 inmates rioted over better living conditions and uh, their political rights. They four days and resulted in 43 people dying, 33 of them being inmates. Uh, the second incident was the Chase Manhattan Bank uh, hostage situation. Uh, later on, they made a movie about it called Dog Day Afternoon. Um, during the situation, uh, John Wadowitz and Salvatore uh, Naturali and Robert Westenberg, they took seven bank employees hostage. Uh, it lasted about 14 hours. It was a botched bank robbery. Um, Westenberg fled before the robbery took place. Uh, Naturali was killed by the police and Wadowitz was taken into custody. Third incident was the uh, Munich Olympics hostage situation in 1972. Uh, in that situation, eight members from the Palestinian terrorist group, Black September, took nine members of the Israeli Olympic team hostage. Um, five of the uh, Members from Black September were killed um, during a bus hostage rescue attempt, and uh, all of the hostages were killed. Uh, and then the uh, final incident was uh, at John and Al's Sporting Goods. Uh, four Sunni Muslims attempted to steal guns, rifles, and am ammunition. Uh, this resulted in the murder of one New York City police officer. Um, the, uh, it was a three hour shootout, and the uh, Standoff lasted 47 hours. Those incidents actually uh, led to the, uh, the need for more crisis negotiations um, instead of using strong arm tactics. Dr. Javi Schlossberg, he was a Freudian psycho, excuse me, psychoanalyst and a former police detective with the uh, New York City Police Department. Uh, he is credited as being the founding father of modern crisis negotiations. In uh, 1983, the FBI created the Hostage Rescue Team, or the HRT, uh, utilizing Dr. Schlossberg's model. And then since then, most of the police departments have formed some type of crisis negotiations team based off the FBI and Dr. Schlossberg's model. Professionally trained and well-equipped crisis negotiations team has been found to uh, substantially reduce the risk of injury or loss of life to, excuse me, loss of life to citizens, officers, and suspects. Uh, to enable a trained and managed team response to critical incidents, results in successful de-escalation and resolution to uh, critical incidents, and uh, be able to provide commanders with an enhanced information gathering resource. The crisis negotiations team operates in conjunction with the department's SWAT team. Uh, CNT is tasked with having a non-lethal and peaceful resolution during high stress and volatile situations. Uh, the picture on the left, this vehicle right here, this is what uh, CNT operates out of. Uh, it is the command center for CNT. Uh, inside that vehicle, there are several workstations and uh, it also 
houses our uh, communications equipment so we can uh, communicate with the offender. Uh, vehicle on the right is an armored vehicle that is used by the SWAT team. For the most part, uh, even though CNT gets activated with SWAT, uh, we do operate um, a little independently. Um, each department is different uh, depending on the size and makeup. Currently, our negotiations team consists of nine members. Um, and as I stated before, we're deployed with the intention of keeping the utilization of force um, to a minimum to resolve an incident. The crisis negotiation team utilizes uh, advanced communications equipment to communicate with offenders and other persons involved in the crisis incident. Um, this picture here is a throw phone. It's deployable. Um, I will show you a picture later on. Uh, there's another device that's attached to it where it can be thrown through a, um, a soft entrance, usually a, a window or a door. Um, it has a a phone attached to it where we can actually speak to the offender. Uh, we also have a device that uh, you can communicate using mobile devices, um, not just a landline. And these options allow the team to provide critical information to the commanders in a timely manner. So the picture on the left, uh, it's one of our role players, he's a team member. Uh, the device that he is actually on is the throw phone. Uh, that is the device that we have the SWAT team deploy, whether they place it at a door or as it states, it's a throw phone. It can be thrown through um, a soft obstacle like a window. And that way the offender can communicate with the negotiators. Um, it is in a uh, impact proof uh, case, so it can be thrown around and it doesn't damage the hardware. Uh, and all the offender has to do is open the box pick up the receiver and have communications um, with the negotiator. Uh, in the picture on the right, uh, you have uh, two negotiators. Typically you'll have a primary negotiator and a secondary or a coach. Uh, the primary negotiator, uh, he's the one that, he or she is the one that will make contact with the offender um, and establish all communications. Uh, the coach will assist the primary negotiator with um, maybe uh, topics that he may have missed. Uh, there's a lot going on. So uh, he'll give uh, the negotiator maybe just some key notes uh, or suggestions that he should uh, speak to the offender about. We also have um, what we call a scribe. Uh, and that person will strictly take notes um, and then provide them to the coach who will then provide them uh, to the negotiator if need be. We also have an intelligence officer, and their job is to gather intel on the offender um, or if there's hostages, information on the hostages as well. And we have a communications liaison, and their job is to communicate back and forth between CNT and the SWAT team. So just a little bit about um, the city's negotiations team. We had an incident back in 2018. Uh, SWAT and CNT were activated after uh, a gunshot was fired during a domestic dispute. Um, after failed negotiations over several hours, uh, the SWAT team deployed tear gas into the residence and uh, the offender surrendered without being harmed. Um, this was a, a joint event with uh, the county and the state police uh, and nobody was injured, nobody was harmed. Back in 2016, we had a standoff uh, on JPA. Uh, this also lasted uh, several hours. It was like, I think it was like six hours, if I recall. Uh, an armed subject barricaded himself in his home after holding his girlfriend against her will. Uh, he did release her. Uh, we negotiated with him for a while. Uh, he was refusing to come out. The SWAT team decided they were going to deploy uh, gas to get him to come out. And during that time, uh, the negotiator was able to have him surrender to the SWAT team.
also back in uh, 2016, uh, SWAT and CNT were activated to serve a high risk search warrant on a home where a suspected bank robber was staying. Uh, there were uh, several occupants in a home. They weren't being held hostage. Uh, they were actually allowed to leave. Uh, that standoff also lasted several hours. Uh, I remember that day, it was a very cold January morning. Uh, after uh, failed negotiations, uh, SWAT fired multiple canisters of tear gas into the home. Uh, did not affect the, the subject. Uh, we did not know until later on, but he had actually wrapped towels, wet towels around his face and he was hiding in a crawl space so that the tear gas didn't affect him. Uh, negotiations continued via telephone and he ultimately surrendered uh, to a negotiator on the phone. Police crisis negotiators also receive advanced training in a variety of subjects, uh, including mental health issues. Um, I know uh, Lieutenant Jones is a lot with CIT you could probably uh, talk a little bit about um, how C CIT actually uh, helps with uh, negotiators when it comes to people uh, dealing with uh, uh, mental health issues. Absolutely. Uh, mental health is obviously a big issue that's uh, ever present, uh, especially in policing because we interact with the public so much. Um, so it's very important for officers uh, to be aware of mental health issues because they present themselves in a variety of ways and you have to be very aware of what you're seeing and hearing when you're talking to people. And this is especially true in crisis negotiations. Uh, you're already dealing with someone who is oftentimes very highly stressed um, due to whatever the situation may be. Um, and that's also a time that mental health issues could present themselves even more, or you could realize that this incident started because of a mental health issue, whether it be bipolar, or schizophrenia, depression, things like that. So being able to recognize those signs is very important um, to being able to communicate with them and try to help safely resolve the situation. Um, the Charlottesville Police Department regularly sends officers to the uh, crisis uh, intervention training um, that talks and focuses very strongly on mental health issues, but also really uh, does a good job of just teaching officers overall how to communicate with people who are in a crisis uh, in general. Uh, mental health issues is one component of any number of situations that we respond to, but a lot of times um, it's easy to say that whether this is a domestic dispute or a neighbor's arguing, in that moment, they, those folks are in some type of uh, emotional crisis that has kind of brought this situation to a head. Um, so being trained in mental mental health issues help significantly uh, when dealing with those events. Uh, all the members on the uh, negotiations team for the city uh, have been to CIT uh, training and they, they've been uh, certified. Uh, when it comes to use of force and civil liability, obviously with uh, CNT, uh, it's all about soft hand tactics. And when I say soft hand tactics, um, you know, we're, we're not the SWAT team uh, SWAT team will go in and uh, obviously they have their weapons, they're going to go in and um, if there's a, a shooter, they're going to address the shooter, whatever the case may be. But um, negotiations is a, a different tactic. Like I said, it's soft hand tactic. It's, it's more verbal. It's all about the communication. It's all about trying to establish a rapport with somebody. Um, with that happening, uh, you have a less chance of using force, which reduces your civil liability. Um, you also learn a uh, psychology and personality traits, uh, which kind of goes back to what you might do in CIT, um, intelligence gathering and threat assessment, and then enabling a tactical resolution. Uh, with uh, CNT, what we'd like to do is obviously uh, talk to the person and talk them down and have them surrender peacefully. Uh, but if we have to send in uh, the SWAT team, then we'll do that. But obviously that would be at a last resort. Um, unless once again, um, you have something like an active shooter, then uh, you're not going to have CNT if there's an active shooter situation and there's active gunshots. Well, then you're going to activate the SWAT team and you're going to go in and you're going to address the threat right away. Each negotiator is required to attend a 40 hour course on crisis negotiations after they've been appointed to the team. Um, so they're not allowed to negotiate until they've been to that school, but they can still be a team member. They can uh, 
know, come to monthly trainings, they just can't negotiate until they've been to that 40 hour school. Um, negotiators have monthly training that we're required uh, to attend to help develop and maintain your skills. Uh, I know uh, people think about you know negotiators and it's just a lot of talking, uh, but it is a perishable skill. Um, and if you don't maintain it, uh, you will lose it. Uh, another thing about uh, crisis negotiators, it's not a lot like what you see in the Hollywood movies. Um, you'll see, and I've showed a couple of pictures that show the SWAT team, because rarely will you see a negotiator um, uh, in public. You'll see the SWAT team, and that's part of their tactic. Uh, you'll see them geared up, you'll see their vehicles, you'll see their weapons, um, but the negotiators are typically housed in a command post uh, out of sight from the offender. Uh, the negotiators also uh, attend additional training schools that are provided um, and you have the cost of negotiations uh, two and three and other schools that you can attend to maintain your skills. All right, some of the methods used by uh, crisis negotiations team uh, include, but are not limited to, uh, active listening. Uh, so active listening is exactly what it is. It's you're listening to that person. Uh, some of our uh, our makeup being human beings, um, we listen a little bit and we kind of will hear something and then we start formulating the thought process. So we know what we're gonna say when it's our turn to talk. Uh, but when you do that, you're not listening to 100% of what that person's saying to you because in your mind, you're developing what you wanna say. Uh, when you do active listening, uh, you need to listen 100% to what that person's saying. Um, if you're able to see that person, uh, then you can also read that person's body language. That's also a part of active listening. Um, isolation and containment. Uh, the best way to resolve an incident is keep the offender uh, isolated and contained. Uh, you don't want the offender to go mobile. Um, that just increases the chance of that situation uh, going tactical. Um, and uh, that's something that we as negotiators, we try, uh, like I said, to, to keep it from going to that point. I mentioned earlier about rapport building. Uh, it's all about time, talking to that person. Uh, you know, I know we'll get on a phone with somebody we don't know that person. Um, we don't steer them the wrong way. Uh, we do care about everybody in that situation. At the end of the day, we want everybody to go home safely and unharmed. Um, so it's all about building trust with that person on the phone. Um, we don't lie to anybody. Uh, we tell them exactly uh, what's going on. A little bit of what may happen. Um, uh, we, we do try to minimize a little bit, um, but we don't lie to anybody because if you lie to somebody, well, then you can't establish that trust. If you started establishing trust and they found out you lied to them, then you have no more trust and you lost control of that situation. Um, but once you start building rapport and you build a little bit of trust, then you're able to influence that person and hopefully persuade them to surrender peacefully. We also provide them with a safe means uh, to surrender without harm. Um, so what we'll do is, we'll just uh, an example, say we have a, a suicidal subject uh, that's barricading in their home. Um, and we've been talking to them for a couple of hours. We built that rapport, um, let them know they, ha they haven't committed any crimes. Um, but we do tell them that, yes, when you come out, you will see officers, you'll see weapons, uh, but no one's gonna harm you. No one's gonna point their guns at you. You know, just make sure you have your hands up nothing in your hands, uh, an officer's gonna approach you, they're gonna put you in handcuffs for everybody's safety. And then uh, we're gonna take you to the hospital so you can speak with someone. Um, but uh, we put it all out there so they can understand what they're walking into when that door opens up. Uh, CNT members utilize a flexible mindset ensuring the maximum opportunity um, to negotiate offender demands. Uh, accepting the demands for the exchange of hostages, weapons, or control substances, which are not needed for the preservation of life. Uh, so basically, um, we will, obviously, we're negotiators. So if we have an offender and the offender says, hey, you know, listen, I'd like to get some food. Okay, you know, we can do that. You know, we need some drinks. We need um, wh whatever they may need. Uh, we're flexible. We're open-minded, and we can do that. But it's all about negotiating. So uh, basically, if I'm going to give you something, then uh, we like you to give us something in return as good faith. Um, we're not going to introduce alcohol. We're not going to introduce any drugs into the situation because that doesn't help any. Um, and what we like to do, if we have those items 
uh, in the house. We like to get those out, uh, especially weapons as well. You know, try to negotiate the weapons. Uh, if you don't want to come out and you have weapons, maybe you can throw your weapons outside. You know, um, just that way it, it keeps everybody safe or safer. The Charlottesville Police Department's crisis negotiation team is comprised of police officers from all divisions within the department. Our team uh, currently have members who are detectives, uh, patrol officers. We have uh, you know, sergeants, uh, corporals. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a mix up. Um, the team structure consists of both admin and operational functions. So we have a, uh, a team commander, which is uh, Lieutenant Jones and I am the team leader. Uh, we have an assistant team leader um, who's a corporal. And then we have, as I mentioned earlier, your primary negotiator, um, your coach, your scribe, your intelligence officer, and your communications liaison. That is it from the presentation. Thank you so much. That was really, really, really interesting. I do apologize um, we, for speaking really fast. Uh, I try to slow it down, but it's, uh, it's kind of hard for me to do. <laughs> before I ask, ask you um, these questions that we have, um, I wanted to ask you if you would um, talk about this symbol for crisis negotiators, this, um, this night piece, actually, oh, right? We, yeah, that's used by multiple departments, and uh, it's a yes, it is a, a night chess. It's a chess piece, and it just symbolizes uh, the different tactical moves that negotiators use um, to have a, uh, an offender um, come down and surrender to us. Great, thank you. Um, so there are several questions. Um, First is, um, please discuss the Guns Down organization and the cooperation that exists between police and Guns Down. Uh, <clears throat> I believe the Guns Down organization uh, works to reduce gun ownership and gun crime. Um, I'm not aware of the partnership that it has with the police department um, myself personally. I know Chief Brackney uh, is very outspoken in regards to things like that um, and has regularly been engaged with the community and also legislators about um, gun crime um, and things along those lines. Um, so I think she is the better person to talk to you about that um, in terms of the department's position and involvement with those things, um, just because at my level, um, that's more of a political lobbying and uh, social intervention um, kind of an organization. And mm -hmm. officers engage with the public and on, on a street level way to talk about these things. But um, obviously an organization like that is involved in much larger uh, discussions with not just the community, but also the government about how to better legislate and deal with gun crime in this country. Okay, thank you. Um, so there is a question um, from, from a family member of someone involved in an incident. And um, <clears throat> I think that if you were not involved, it's likely that we will need to respond back and I can, you know, I have in information to do that. But this question is about um, a seriously mental ill son who attempted to kill his housemate recently um, and there was not um, action taken uh, um, for, um, for, for treating. So it was treated as a he said, she said, mm -hmm. um, and there were, you know, there were, uh, there were, there was evidence of physical, physical harm. Mm -hmm. So um, the housemate tried to press the charges that, that were not taken. Um, and the and the son was not not taken in for evaluation, so I think um, that, so. The question is, um, what what could have been done differently? And if you don't, you know, if this was not your case, um, I would imagine that you know we can we can facilitate an answer um, back to to this person who's asking this question, whose family was involved. 
Uh, yeah, it's often very difficult to answer questions like that um, with limited information just based on what one person is kind of telling me, um, but I'll do the best that I can. I mean, obviously, the situation that's described does not sound good, and it sounds like that there um, should have been some type of intervention taking place. However, it's very difficult to know uh, what was said or what was done and the reasons for that. Um, when dealing with people with mental illness or even uh, if this was just a dispute between them and their roommate, um, it's often can be very hard to make heads or tails of who's telling the truth and how everything played out exactly um, to make the determination about who's at fault or who can be held accountable. Um, usually when it comes to things related to mental health, um, it seems like officers should be able to uh, go in, make an assessment of that person, and if they think that they are troubled or having some sort of an issue, that they can just from there uh, force them to go to the hospital, and that's not quite the case. Um, they really do have to espouse some, some views uh, that they want to harm themselves or others. And I know that getting into a, a, a physical altercation with another person might seem like that would signal that, but people get into fights with their roommates or friends or others on a regular basis. We deal with that quite a bit. And that does not mean that all those people qualify to be taken in for a mental health evaluation as a result of that. Um, it may mean they need to uh, stop doing some other things that may be contributing to that, like uh, alcohol or substance abuse or any number of other things that could be in play. Um, but if it is a genuine mental health issue, officers are trained to go in and try to make that assessment. Um, but we are limited in our powers um, in terms of how we can just go in and forcibly take someone to the hospital. Um, there has to be some very specific signs um, that this person has to be uh, issued, taken in on what's called an emergency custody order or an ECO. Um, and it really has to do with a failure to care for themselves. So think of something more along the lines of an elderly person or even someone who uh, has a diminished mental capacity. Um, it again goes back to someone who's espoused views to harm themselves or others, um, has made a plan to commit suicide um, or, some combination thereof of all these things sometimes taken in totality not just the one thing but everything overall um but i'd be interested to know more about the incident that we're talking about and see if more could have been done um police officers are certainly not perfect and sometimes we're asked to make snap judgments about incidents that we've been thrown into um with a lot of contradictory information coming from two different parties about how all things have, these things have come about. Um, and that can be very hard to sort through and make the right call. But oftentimes we do, but every now and then there may be something we've missed. So I'm more than willing to uh, try to help anyone who needs this readdress. Okay, thank you. And I think in this case, since there's several more questions, sure. I will, I'll do that um, with you offline um, yes, and you, you can pick up that conversation. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Um, so the next question is, in terms of resolving critical incidents through effective communication, can you expound on how this is done? Uh, I'm sure Sergeant Handy will want to get in on this, but I'll, I'll say that it's the way that that's worded, it, it really does explain as best as I feel uh, what crisis negotiations does in that, you know, you show up to a situation that oftentimes we deploy out with the SWAT team a lot of times. So those are often very serious situations. Um, but the goal of the crisis negotiations team is so that a lot of that additional personnel and uh, equipment is not needed. The hope is always that we can get that phone into those people or contact them on the cell phone or establish some type of communication with them where we can start to build a rapport with them and get an understanding of what's going on and why we've been called to that scene on that given day to, to deal with the issue. Um, and I said, as I said before, um, it could be a variety of reasons. You know, it could be mental health. It could be uh, the fact that someone's just, this today is, the day that they've had enough with whatever the situation is and decided to do this. 
Um, or it could be in the case of, uh, as, uh, as Sergeant Handy outlined earlier, you know, this is a botched crime. Um, this was a robbery that started and then they kind of got caught in the middle of it. Um, so establishing communication with them is important to kind of understand how all this came to be. And then from there, uh, talk with them, you know, reassure them that, you know, uh, this doesn't have to end in a bad way, that there's still options to be explored um, outside of feeling like they're trapped inside and the police are outside and, you know, what are they going to do? Um, so we do that through just talking to them and getting an understanding from them about who they are, how they came to be in this situation. Um, and also, again, not being dire about the situation itself, that there's always an opportunity for this to be resolved in a peaceful way that's not going to make them feel like their life is over when this situation comes to a conclusion, that there are different avenues that can be explored. You know, uh, I don't work for the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, um, but obviously they are open to the idea of negotiating, you know, criminal sentencing and things like that with those people. So, you know, just telling them again that it's, it's not the end of the world if they surrender and come outside. But the only way we can ever get to that point is by first, you know, opening up that line of communication with them and talking with them to just kind of de-escalate the situation verbally as best we can. Um, and just reassure them that, you know, we're only there to help. We're not there to, you know, punish them in any more of a punitive manner and also to just tell them that it's okay to come outside. There might be a lot of officers out there with guns and things outside, but it's okay to come outside and we'll ensure their safety if they do. Great, thank you. Um, there are <clears throat> a couple of questions um, regarding so adding social workers. And I have a feeling that this might be a Chief Brackney question, but um, the, the, in, in summary for both of the questions and, and, and I can follow up with the people who have asked the questions when I, when I, when I get the answers to them offline again after, after the session. Um, the question is uh, about uh, thought, thoughts regarding adding a social worker to the crisis negotiation team to aid in resolving critical in incidents, you know, as a, as a, as a um, supplement to, to the team. Um, and then the other specifically referenced um, hiring social workers as part of team modeling. There, there was a program in Oregon um, that, that has been spoken a lot about recently. And so I don't know if you have this information or if it's something that we need to get a more formal answer provided by Chief Brackney sent, you know, sent out to the attendees. <laughs> Another chief Bradley question. Um, I, I know this is an answer to the, the, yeah, the question, but uh, we recently have, now they're not social workers, but we've recently um, hired uh, several uh, recruits that have uh, social work degrees and um, psychology degrees. So uh, those are resources that we can use internally um, if we had an incident because of their background. Um, but as far as uh, employing specific social workers, uh, to assist in yeah, that part, I would not know um, the proper answer. Okay. And I would also comment, we do work with Region 10 um, in relation to uh, reaching out and asking questions if we are talking with a, an offender who we think may have um, you know, some sort of connection to that or just to find out if there's someone we could put them in touch with potentially uh, to help us with that as well. So we, it's not that we don't want their help, it's just that they're not built into the team, but we do right. utilize that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, and this, is, thank you. Um, this is um, a question about your staffing right now. Um, do, you do you know, and again, I can send a general, a general email to all the people who registered for this event. Um, how many staff CPD is down currently? Um, currently, I believe we are down approximately nine positions. Uh, we okay. just hired seven more recruits. Uh, they will start the academy um, July 6th, I believe it is. Um, and then we're currently in a process 
of uh, recruiting more for the next academy in January, but I believe it's just uh, nine positions currently. Well, and you just had to graduate. Yes, we did. Yes. Right. So the, and and they're, in, they're in field training? Correct. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Um, more questions. Just give me a second. Um, so here's a question. What are the greatest misperceptions you face in your role um, in crisis negotiations? Uh, I really think that a lot of people uh, think that what we do is like Hollywood, like what you see in the movies. Um, I know one of the most popular movies out there uh, is The Negotiator uh, with Samuel Jackson and uh, Kevin Spacey. And uh, yeah, that's not, like I said, it's not what we do. Um, we're not, we have had face-to-face -face negotiations, uh, but typically, uh, once again, your negotiators are in the background, uh, rarely seen. Um, it's the SWAT team that's up front, ready to go. If, uh, you know, the CNT commander says, hey, um, it's time to breach. But yeah, what you see on TV for the negotiators, as far as the negotiator having face-to-face -face contact with the offender or going inside a bank um, to check out the hostages, that doesn't happen uh, because the negotiator is not going to put themselves in harm's way. They're not going to give the offender another hostage. Uh, the negotiators are housed uh, in a separate unit, and that's where they, they typically stay at. So uh, that's a misconception uh, as far as Hollywood in, in real life. And I guess that's really not surprising either. Um, so what makes a good crisis negotiator is the next question. Uh, it's, so you have to be able to talk to people. <laughs> uh, you have to have a lot of empathy. Uh, you have to be uh, very patient um, because you're dealing with people in crisis and they're gonna scream at you. Um, they're gonna call you names. You're gonna be swearing at you. and you have to be able to let that roll, roll off you. You can't take it personally. Um, because like I said, that person is experiencing some type of crisis. Um, so you have to, like I said, be empathetic, sympathetic, um, you know, understanding. Um, and you have, like I said, you have to have the ability to talk to somebody um, and also remain calm. Uh, because if you start getting amped up while they already amped up, it just, it, it creates uh, a conflict that you're not gonna uh, recover from. So when that person is amped up, your job is to try to bring them down. So uh, if you have the ability to remain calm in those high stress situations, uh, that's, that's great. Um, so yeah, just, you have to, like I said, uh, good communicator, patience, um, empathy, yes. Great, thank you. Um, a question that I had um, when you listed um, all of the different types of roles and team members that, that, that are on, the, on a crisis negotiation team, is every single one of those roles represented at every crisis negotiation? Uh, no, they're not. So in, every situation is different. Uh, you might have an officer roll up on something um, and request that, you know, we need negotiators. Um, you might not have the entire team, uh, typically, what we like to do is have a minimum of two people uh, where you have your primary negotiator and your coach. Uh, you don't just want to have one person. Uh, so a minimum of two people. But those two people, well, you have your negotiator and you have your coach. Uh, your coach can also act as a scribe. Um, your commander is going to uh, show up on scene. Uh, he'll be able to you know, take a role as far as grabbing intel. Um, but yeah, uh, typically... We want a minimum of two people, uh, ideally the entire team, but at least two people. Okay. Um, and I have um, one last question. What do you learn to avoid in a negotiation? Um, well, it, it depends. So uh, you have to listen to what the offender is saying. Um, you know, they might tell you, you know, don't call me, sir. Um, and if you keep calling them, sir, well, uh, you're going to escalate the situation. Um, you avoid giving into all their demands. You can't, once again, we're very flexible. Um, we're negotiators. We're going to negotiate, but we just can't meet your every demand and you give us nothing. Um, 
but uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it goes back to what I said in one of the earlier slides about active listening. Uh, you really have to listen to what the offender is saying. Um, that way you can avoid hot topics, you can avoid triggers, um, things that are gonna set the offender off, but you have to be able to, to listen so you can figure those things out. Cause sometimes they don't tell you intentionally, you have to pick up those cues too. Um, so. Okay, great. Well, that is a lot of great information. Um, do either of you have anything that um, you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just appreciate you uh, putting this together and giving us an opportunity to talk about um, something that both myself and Sergeant Handy are very involved in and uh, that we enjoy doing. And it's a pleasure to certainly provide this information and hopefully inform the community uh, a lot about what we do and perhaps break some misconceptions as we, we have a little bit with these questions about what it's really like when the crisis negotiation team gets deployed. And also to really highlight what our, our true intentions and mission are uh, when we show up. Again, it's to resolve the situation peacefully um, with, without a shot being fired, with no one being hurt, and hopefully everybody coming out and going home safely, the, the offenders, the victims, and the police included. Okay, that's great. Um, there was um, one question that just came in that is a really good question. Um, have your negotiation skills been useful on regular police calls and do you share that training with other officers? Yeah, for me, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm new to the crisis negotiations team as a team commander. Um, however, again, being in CIT, which is again, just another communications piece of, of talking to people and negotiating in a sense, um, it's huge. Uh, I've resolved a lot of conflicts and de-escalated a lot of situations with people through just talking to them. And it's really all the things that we've kind of talked about in this presentation, the act of listening, um, the being aware of what the hot topics are, and then figuring out a way how to get this person to, uh, to cooperate. And, you know, sometimes again, just figure out a way to get them some help um, that they, they may be much in need of. As a, as a patrol officer, I mean, you know, officers wear many hats and uh, you get out there, you speak to people, uh, you're going to go to uh, disorders, you're going to go to domestics. And even if you haven't been trained in crisis negotiations, uh, you're going to de-escalate de that situation. Um, and if you've been trained in crisis negotiations, you will use your training uh, when you go to these calls. Uh, and it, it, it works, yes. And it also works in your personal life as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes domestic relations as it were right yes. thank you larry and russ for it's been such an interesting presentation we really we appreciate you walking us through it all um the next lunch and learn will be held on wednesday july 21st and the topic is the crisis and intervention team as we've been or or these guys have been saying today very different from today's topic of crisis negotiation. Um, and we hope to see you there. In the meantime, be well, stay safe, and thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you.